Hi, it's Miles O'Brien from My Radar, and I'm in New York City today with the great Neil deGrasse Tyson to talk about the new season of Cosmos, his relationship with Carl Sagan, and the larger issue of science communication in a rather complex and sometimes scary world. Don't get me started on that. <laughs> we will eventually. Good to see you again. Yes, always. It's been too long. It's All right, long. let's talk about Cosmos. Mm -hmm, Just sure. a few words on how you came to that project. Well, it's my second occasion hosting Cosmos. The first time was six years ago, 2014, uh, Cosmos, a space-time odyssey. And that was the jump-starting of the, dare I call it a franchise, that was birthed in 1980 with Carl Sagan as host. And uh, I had encounters with Andrian, his widow, who is sort of the secret sauce throughout all the cosmoses. If you part the curtains, she is there as writer, co-writer of all three. And then you realize, well, what do they all have in common? It's her. And she asked if I would consider hosting Cosmos. Those are big shoes to fill, though. You must have had some hesitation about the comparison that would be inevitable. No, I actually didn't. Only because I knew that you don't ever try to fill someone else's shoes, because you'll fail at it. So all you can do is be yourself, where you know you can succeed. So I knew I could be myself, and that's what I offered Cosmos. But in terms of Carl Sagan's presence on the landscape, he established an entire way that you would bring science to the public. He cleared the field for us. So we're all on this, in this place that he first conceived. And, and in that sense, are we filling his shoes? No, we're continuing a legacy. He cleared the field with some personal injury, I guess you could say, in the sense that his fellow scientists looked at him and said, you're, you're, you're dumbing down our subject. It really must have come from people who never saw Cosmos, because it's a smart program. Nowhere in Cosmos would you say, he's dumbing this down, he's insulting my intelligence. That is not that way, okay? Carl Sagan had a sort of fireside manner. It's a manner that I have attempted to make a fundamental part of how I interact with people, where they feel comfortable around you, comfortable listening. They don't feel like they're in a lecture. They don't feel like they're getting talked down to. They feel empowered by what they have learned. This is part of the anatomy of Carl's legacy that I am delighted and I'm honored to be a part of. Where are you headed with this season? So Cosmos, one of the things it's done best is be able to tell stories. So every episode, there's a story of, of a historical uh, character, a scientist who has struggled to communicate something that they've discovered as a new objective truth, but they met opposing forces of culture, of, of, of politics, of bias. And you get a firsthand view of what the struggles were in the hope and expectation that you look at today and say, well, wait a minute, we have scientists struggling to communicate some objective truths, and I see some of the same resistance to it, just because of people's, um, either because they're not science literate or they have bias, they, 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 or, or they just don't want something to be true that actually is, and you can't wish away an objective truth. Something that I've always said, one of the most important things about science is that it's true whether or not you believe in it. If experiment has verified this, go on to the next thing, accept it and move on, all right? Don't say, well, I, don't, I choose not, you don't have that option. No. So in this it, subtitled Cosmos Possible World, it's an exploration not only of exoplanets, of which we have multiple thousands in the catalog now. Oh, that's bigger, that's smaller, that has this conditions, as those conditions. And you say, where does Earth fit into that? Is Earth going to become one of these? Do, can we protect it from what these uh, outcomes are? Venus, to our left, has a runaway greenhouse effect in our own solar system. It's 900 degrees Fahrenheit on Venus. It used to be, we, we think it used to have lush running water and continents and oceans. How about Mars? Mars has evidence of dried riverbeds and and lakes, nothing there, something bad happened to our left and to our right. Possible worlds is not only the kind of world we might want to create for ourselves, it's the warnings of other worlds that 
have gone astray. And what knobs are we turning today that may create irreversible damage to our future such that our descendants would be embarrassed to declare that we were their ancestors rather than proud of what we might have introduced to enable the next generation to thrive in a future Earth. That takes wisdom. And Cosmos is all about not only imparting knowledge about the science, uh, emotions for how you might respond to it, but wisdom for what you'll do about the challenges that face us. That is right at the heart of Carl Sagan's message, isn't it? This idea that with, with a slight perturbation in either direction, we can either lead ourselves to certain doom or to really great things, but it just takes going in the right direction. Yeah, and you need a longer view than just the moment. You need not only a longer view, you need a cosmic perspective. Coupled with a long view, that's really potent. That's, well, here's how we fit in the world, and here's the direction I want to take it. And by the way, it's not uh, fit in the world, not only how you fit in the universe, but how do we fit in our own biosphere? What does it mean if the day will come, if it has not already, that there's more plastic in the ocean than there are fishes swimming among? What does that even mean? How does, what, what have we done? And so it's a wake-up call. And by the way, there are a lot of wake-up calls that just say, we're all going to die, we're all going to die. But Cosmos is not that. Cosmos is, we're all going to thrive. And here's how and here's why. Or we might die. <laughs> it, the, the, the vision is so compelling, you will not walk away and say, we're all going to die unless we're going to do that, which is true. You'll instead say, we're just going to do that. That is the future. That's the future I want. I'm old enough, perhaps you are too, because I think I'm older than you. Uh, the World's Fair, New York World's Fair, 1964-65. I was there. Uh, you were there, I was there. And it was like, whoa, look at this world. Oh, it was the future, and it was real, and you could touch it. And there was the future you could touch, and the future you could dream about. It was, it was like, whoa. I'm not thinking, boy, if we don't do this, we'll all die from nuclear holocaust. I'm not thinking the bad. I'm thinking all good. So, yeah, you got to know that there are bad consequences. I don't want to diminish that. But when the beautiful options are laid out in front of you, you can't help but band together and say, that's the world I want to live in. So you are an optimist. I'm a realist. Uh, it's spiced with optimism. <laughs> I love that line, when would you like our future to begin? I love it too. And there it is in Cosmos. You also begin, it's, it's on, a, on a dark note, we're talking about extinctions. Extinction was not even known or understood until relatively recently, scientifically. Only a couple hundred years ago was extinction really even a thing to behold. And what we know today is that there's a brand new era in the geologic chart. You've heard about the Triassic period or the, or the Jurassic period. You've heard about, uh, all right, there's another one. The Anthropocene, it has been dubbed. Anthropocene, Anthropocene, human, okay? It is a period in Earth's history where the mark of the existence of humans on Earth is manifest everywhere. In the, in the animals, in the oceans, in the terrain. All of this, because of human presence, we are exacting a wave of extinction in the tree of life that rivals the five great waves of extinction that have happened before. And we're the cause of that. And on a level where do we even understand the consequences of this to us? Let's think selfishly. If those animals are gone because we are asserting ourselves, how's that gonna bite us on the ass later? Is that, is that, is it, do we even know? And that's just thinking selfishly. Meanwhile, how about thinking globally? What, how about the rest of the world? How does this matter to all the living creatures? For example, in recent years, we've learned much more about what role nuances in the biosphere are playing in sustaining the biosphere. And we are part of that system. This is explored in Cosmos. When we talk about possible worlds, it's not just worlds beyond Earth, we're talking about Earth itself. And the Anthropocene is a period that we're still trying to understand how big the human hammer has been 
on this earth and what the consequences are and how reversible are they, if at all. You start out with a pretty good dose of stark reality and then you try to pivot into the possibilities, the wonderment of it all. Um, is that a hard turn to make? It's not hard to turn positive when you're equipped with tools to enable it. The innovations that the human mind have brought to bear on civilization enabled us to not only save us from nature that might have thrown us a curve, uh, things like drought, starvation, and this sort of thing, but also forces of our own making that may have been the seeds of our own undoing. So these are lessons that I think can give us confidence going forward that no, we're not all gonna die. Do you remember Ray Bradbury, the great mm -hmm. science fiction author? One of my favorite quotes is from him. Someone came up to him and one of his fans said, uh, uh, Mr. Bradbury, why do you always portray these apocalyptic futures? Is this the future you think we're going to have? And he says, no, no. That's the future I show you so that you know to avoid it. You get the sense that we're at this moment in time where it's, there, there is a narrow window a decision that needs to be made in this time and place about what this future is going to look like. And we could, that door could shut by, uh, quickly if we don't do something now. Would you agree with that? Yeah, there are dire consequences to not acting at all and to not acting within the windows where you still have a chance to fix things right. or to reverse things. Maybe not fully reverse them, but at least stave off what might be an apocalyptic path to give you a chance to come up with other solutions. We take you far into the future in the Cosmos series, even to the death of the sun. As the sun dies, in its later years, it'll actually get a little hotter, and Earth will no longer be in the habitable zone, the Goldilocks zone. We either have to find a way to push Earth farther out or planet hop. And then when the sun dies, we'll have to star system hop. You know, so. Uh, the very distant future uh, is even included in the explorations of this series. If you want to think about whether humanity can really stand the test of time and we just don't become extinct like the dinosaurs. I bet it's you a, if the dinosaurs had a space program, they'd still be they'd here. They'd still be here. Uh, totally. Yeah, we wouldn't be here. Because, no, yeah. We wouldn't have risen up yeah, yeah. from underfoot. So we have this chance. To, to beat the odds in extinction, I think. And this series gets right into whether we're going to do that or not. But this idea that the sun will eventually no longer support life as we know it in this solar system is ultimately kind of a very pessimistic statement. However, in your episode uh, on this issue, you, you reminded uh, me of the Polynesians. Oh, yeah. And, and I often marvel at what they did. They got in those little dugout canoes and they go in the Pacific. They have no idea where they're going. They don't know how to navigate. They, and somehow they populated the Pacific. And when you think about what that accomplishment was, it, it is a good analog to what you're thinking about when you think about traveling great distances in space, right? Yeah, it's not only about traveling great distances. It's about stepping off of a, out of your comfort zone into a a completely unknown destination. Uh, it's completely unknown. If you're on the shores of Asia and you're staring out into the Pacific, not knowing if Earth is round or how big the body of ocean is, and you go on in this flotilla of boats, just on the hope that you've got a place to land, and you navigate using stars. They did have navigation tactics. No. It wasn't satellite-based GPS, no. <laughs> a little but before that. They had um, highly innovative navigation tactics, uh, the ancient Polynesians. And for them to then populate all these islands in the South Pacific, right on into the middle of the Pacific Ocean, one of the most isolated archipelago in the world, the Hawaiian Islands, if they had the courage to explore on that level, then solar system hopping should be nothing for us. If that urge is in our DNA, because the next shore that we're standing on is the boundary between Earth's surface and space, and we're looking out 
into the unknown, but it's not as unknown as the ocean was to them. We see, well, we know where the stars are. We know where the exoplanets are. We know how far it is. We know what engineering it's gonna take. We're actually better off than they were. So yes, the death of the sun in that episode is not seen as some inevitable sad point in the future of humans. It is, we, we tap some of that Polynesian DNA because we're all human and we say, uh, let's invoke that sense of adventure and let's pack up and go. It's actually, a, it's one of the more hopeful of the episodes of, of Cosmos. It was interesting you used Voyager as a benchmark of time and space, right? If Voyager were to go to Proxima Centauri, what was it, tens of thousands of years? Yeah, yes, 15,000, yeah. 70,000 years. Which is right. a nice little Easter egg to Carl Sagan, of course, because that was a, a mission he was a part of. As um, was Andrian, yeah. who was the creative director for the, the Golden Record that yeah. was attached to the side of right. Voyager. Yeah. So, Just for people who were born later, the reason why Voyager had this record, this golden record of human sounds and music, was because this is one of the first several spacecraft launched with a trajectory that would never return to the solar system at all. And so if it never returns, there's a chance it could be discovered by some alien civilization. And if they do discover it, let it be this emissary of who we are and what we stand for. And there it was. Hopefully they have an old turntable they can put <laughs> on. Yeah, we'll see. I mean, they probably keep them, right? Yeah, right. sure, yeah. sure. They so, go to the thrift shop. It's in, it's in the back. You talked about your meeting with Carl Sagan in the first season. Yes. And you were a 17-year-old yes. high school student, mm -hmm. and he summoned you to Ithaca, which is an amazing story. That's the right word. And yeah. you had this amazing personal experience with him. How much did you stay in touch with him over the years, and how much did he influence you later on? So um, people wrongly, uh, understandably, but wrongly say that he was my mentor. The, if you say someone's your mentor, that implies you, you see them all the time and they're guiding you at every turn of decision. Um, but let me still use the word mentor, but add to its definition. It's possible for someone to be a mentor who maybe you've never even met. They can be a mentor by example. They can be a mentor, well, I wanna, I see how they are, leading their lives, and I want to emulate that. I count that as a mentor as well. Why not? And so with Carl, I meet him. He invites me. Those who don't know the story, I applied to colleges. I was admitted to Cornell where he was a professor. And apparently, un unbeknownst to me, the admissions office sent my application to him for his comment. Say, is this somebody we should try to get? And do you want to help out? And he sent me a letter. Signed, it says, I, I, you know, dear Neil, I, I'm a professor here at Cornell. I'm told you like the universe. I, you're still deciding on what college. I invite you to come up and visit. I'll show you the lab. Do you have any idea what it was in that application or what he saw? No, in my, my application to college, the universe was all over it. You know, I had a telescope. I walked dogs. I live in an apartment building where there are a lot of dogs, and you can walk dogs at 50 cents per dog per walk. That adds up very quickly. I'm talking way back when 50 cents meant something. And I used that money to buy a, a camera and my, my second telescope, which was bigger than my first one, which was gifted to me when I was 12. And I was in the astronomy club. I, you know, I'd done uh, research in England on a scholarship to study stone monuments like Stonehenge. And that imprinted me so deeply that I found the dates in Manhattan where the sun aligns with the grid. And so I then dubbed that Manhattan Henge which is now, I'm, I'm proud to say, it was lifted into the Oxford English Dictionary. It's now a new oh, word, man. Manhattan Hedge. Congratulations. So, so these are things that I was doing by the time I was 15 and 16. I think he just saw that and said, this person is all in. So I took a bus up to Ithaca, New York in the winter. This is d December. He met me out front of the lab. We brought me to his office, showed, showed me around. And I'll never forget this. He reached back. Didn't even look. Reached back, pulled out one of his books that he wrote. Didn't even look. Just, just a book on the shelf that was one of his books. And then he signed it to me, and I still have that book. Yeah. And when we're done, it started to snow, as it does often in Ithaca in the winter. And he said, the bus doesn't come through. Here's my home number. You can stay with my family until tomorrow, until it clears. It's like, whoa. I was befuddled because he's famous, and I'm not. I'm just a kid. But I realized. Then if I, again, this is sort of by example, if I, I said to myself at the time, if I'm ever 
as remotely famous as he is. I will treat students the way he has treated me just now. I met him at the Jet Propulsion Lab in the early 90s when I was a CNN correspondent, and he, he pulled me aside and insisted I have lunch with him. And I had this, I was thrilled, of course. And he never let go. He, he would call me all the time and suggest story ideas, um, things that should be on CNN, things that are wrong on CNN that he wanted to correct. And I firmly believe he was looking for a non-religious apostle to, to go out there and be a vessel for uh, what was so near and dear to his heart. And whether it was in an academic setting or a media setting, he really felt so strongly about that. Do, would you agree? I mean, yes, I would communication agree. was so important. No, I mean, he understood yeah. the value yeah. of communication right. on that level. And he's also cares a lot about passing the torch. Uh, that science is not a one-person job. It's, a, it's not only many people within a generation, it's multi-generational. And if that torch is not properly passed, you can have dead ends where pathways could have led to highly fertile discoveries. So he was doing his job in a sense. He didn't have to, of course, but if you look back on it and say, yes, he cared about the health of the future of science and saw me as someone who could continue to pass that torch. And maybe that's why he reached out to me for that same reason, because of the health and future and communication of science. But you're, you're carrying the torch in a hurricane these days. It's hard to keep it lit. Uh, tell me about what it's like to try to keep actual facts, science, in the middle of the discussion as opposed to being an optional thing on the fringes and drowned out by the political to and fro. Yeah, you have to be tactical, I have discovered. And maybe this was always known, but I had to discover it for myself. You can't beat people on the head and say, no, you're wrong. As we learn from psychological research, if someone feels something is true by whatever motive, be it political, cultural, religious, economic, if they feel something is true and they want it to be true and you tell them it's not true, one of the responses is they dig their heels in more deeply and double down on what is not true. And so you have to be more tactical about it. You have to allow them to arrive at the truth through their own pathways of thought. And the only way that can happen is if you know how their pathways of thought are pre-wired. I can't have this conversation with you unless I have some sensitivity to what's going on inside your head. Uh, so that's the difference between lecturing to you and communicating with you. That's the difference. So, yeah, a big part of my day is disentangling the mental roadways that lead people to think things that are not true. Sometimes you use some fun humor, just a little bit of fun, you know. I tweeted a few days ago, I wonder what anti-vaxxers would say to a coronavirus vaccine. That's all. Did I beat anyone on the head with that? No. I just put it out there. That went viral, and it's one of my top 10 tweets in the last decade. I, it resonates like, oh my gosh, let me rethink this, okay? This, let me understand the implications of this. Is it going to be a season four? <laughs> so someone came up to Anne one time. I was with her for an interview. and as, So are you going to run out of topics? I think she started the answer and I just jumped right in with her. It's like, it's the entire freaking universe. <laughs> if you want to ask if you're going to run out of subjects, talk to anybody else making television. Don't bring that to the person who's talking about the universe, okay? Um, so, so first, no, there's an unlimited source of highly fertile content out there. And it's, there seems to be no end of challenges that we face in civilization new challenges that arise that were not even yet dreamt of in a previous incarnation. So uh, I don't see why there wouldn't be another season. There's no reason for me to continue. I mean, my father used to run track and ran the relay. It's not a torch, but it's a baton. And you pass the baton to the next person, and they might even be able to run faster than you can and take it to the finish line. Cosmos Possible Worlds premieres Monday, March 9th. There'll be 13 episodes in all. 
watch it on the National Geographic channel. Neil deGrasse Tyson, always a pleasure to see you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I'm Miles O'Brien from My Radar. Thank you.